So to save time and stay up to the point, uh, I will focus on dialect as something that represents uh, non-standard language. So the issues that apply to dialect also apply to other forms of language that are considered non-standard. So I will also give more specific explanations of what I mean by dialect and the larger context of uh, non-standard and how they affect each other. Um, to begin with, dialect is a marker of identity of everyday life. It's very frequently used, and in fact, it's rarely not used. Arguably, every form of language is a dialect, even the one that for one reason or another was agreed on as a standard official form. But more than that, dialect, along with other forms of non-standard, also performs a variety of functions in literature. So these functions go beyond the aesthetic and literary purpose. What they do is establish sociocultural and political nuances. Um, they also convey issues of identity, nationhood, and history that particular dialects uh, represent and serve as significant sociolinguistic subcodes. These multiple functions of dialect become especially important and especially problematic in translation. In some cases, negative stereotypes are associated with non-standard linguistic devices, which often results in them being regarded as an inferior, incorrect, and impolite usage of language, a linguistic taboo. It is sometimes referred to as bad language, something that deviates from the standard, approved, and formal use. In many cases, dialect is translated into standard language, which, which results in the text suffering a loss of individual character. A possible solution to this loss is attempting to achieve an equivalent effect in translation uh, using an existing dialect of the target culture or by creating a new one. Another option is to attempt uh, to convey the non-standard quality in other ways, such as using non-standard linguistic items such as slang. Uh, however, it is also one of the most problematic challenges in literary translation considering the inherent differences between languages and cultures. So what is dialect? In everyday life, as well as in literary form, the terms standard and non-standard might cause confusion. Drawing strict boundaries, as well as presenting exact definitions of them is a complicated task. The question that causes most confusion is what exactly is a dialect, and there doesn't seem to be a straight answer. Above all, dialect is regarded as a non-standard form of language. Dialect is often confused with jargon and slang. In other words, other forms of non-standard language can, meet, can be inaccurately uh, regarded as dialect, even though using non-standard words does not equal dialect. To complicate matters, the labels themselves have been used in many different ways, and what one person would call local dialect, others would call local jargon or local slang. But the main difference is that unlike slang or jargon, dialect has a system. So while slang and jargon are essentially vocabularies uh, of words and expressions, uh, dialect is a version of a language, and languages have phonologies, morphologies, syntax, and semantics also as seen in Peter Dredgill's diagram right there on the slide, uh, dialect encompasses the social aspect as well as the regional one. It is associated with a particular uh, geographical location as well as a social group. The confusion usually arrives because dialect is regarded primarily as something unusual. It is different from standard language that is predominantly used almost everywhere, uh, education, media, and other public areas. And there's a possible implication that the usage of language other than standard is incorrect, inaccurate, and inferior. Despite the fact that dialect qualifies as a language in its own right, it is diminished to the basic sense of being strange and unusual. The situation is worsened by the fact that uh, as non-standard, Dialect is forced to remain predominantly spoken, not cataloged and without written representation. Especially in literary texts, it is mixed with slang, jargon, colloquial, and other non-standard variations. 
uh, and I will also include other items of non-standard language while discussing dialect. One of the ways of representing and recording dialects is unusually literature. Writing in dialect can be regarded as a statement in itself, uh, a sort of a resistance to the dominance of standard language. The usage of uh, dialect in literature reached its peak in the 19th century because until then it was mostly used for comical purposes. Mark Twain's The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn can be considered a pivotal element, uh, a pivotal event in dial uh, dialectal storytelling. Before it was published in 1885, uh, dialect had only been applied in dialogue rather than narrative. Representation of dialect mainly functions as a device to enhance realism, to reveal the background and peculiarities of the characters, to inform the reader about region, and to provide local color. But beyond these literary functions, dialect also establishes cultural, political, and social nuances. Firstly, dialect is able to convey identity. As it is linked to a particular region or community of speakers who share common experiences, it becomes a really powerful tool for evoking pride uh, and integrity of a community. And the very fact that dialect is used um, in fiction sends a message that it exists and that it's accessible, uh, acceptable, uh, even encouraged, uh, and also serving as a reminder of it. It enhances the political role of dialect, which otherwise usually suffers from political repression. Importantly, dialects also reveal the cultures behind them. Using dialect uh, brings a number of cultural references and associations. Local dialect becomes the symbol of cultural values. It's a sign behind which stands a particular culture, and it can be linked to historical events, the character of the city it is attached to, or to certain experiences. Above all, it signals a specific and distinctive role of the underlying cultural life the dialect automatically presents. Literature also makes for a perfect medium to explore dialect and also a way to codify it. This is especially important considering that dialect, uh, dialects lack written representation and are predominantly spoken. Uh, literary representations of dialects allow us to analyze and compare them, taking them from the underground status and into a more eminent form. Translating dialects um, is without doubt a task of highest possible difficulty. Writing in dialect is potentially difficult for the writer. It is potentially difficult for the reader, especially someone who is not familiar with a particular dialect. Um, in a way, it turns reading into a process of deciphering. It is also potentially difficult for the translator who must not only comprehend the dialect, but also transform it into another language. The translator plays an essential role in this network. The task of translating a dialect requires from the translator a careful choice of strategy, considering not only the linguistic and aesthetic features of the text, but also the political, social, and cultural nuances. Four main strategies can be distinguished that translators can choose when confronted with a dialectal text. One is to find equivalent forms in the target language, for example, a possibly corresponding dialect. Two, to render the source dialect into the standard form of the target language. Three, to use an alternative version of language that is not exactly a dialect, but shows its um, non-standard quality in other ways. Or four, uh, to indicate that non-standard is used while still using standard language. The first and second strategies are the two opposites. The second strategy that is using standard language for translation seems to be most commonly employed in most cultures and languages. And the number of speakers doesn't seem to play that important a part because the situation is similar in Spain with around 500 million speakers worldwide, as well as Estonia with a little over 1 million. 
Meanwhile, the first strategy seeks to save the qualities of dialect in a highly creative way, finding possible equivalence in the target language. This creative strategy is used more often in theater translation. Usually it's because the nature of performance makes it impossible or very difficult to avoid it. For example, the dynamic between a standard and dialect is the central point of the Gmailian. In the Spanish translation of the play, Florial Matia shows the dialectal variant of people from the south of Spain, Canary Islands, and South America. He uses omission of consonants or, uh, and syllables at the end of the word and adding apostrophes that are characteristic to this dialect. Um, and you can see uh, some examples on the slide. So basically, these examples include using da instead of dos, the sodad instead of the sodados, uh, and other similar cases. Um, this technique does, to some extent, convey the spirit and the social condition of the character as it appears in the original work. Um, and to some extent, uh, convey what was meant uh, in the original. We can see another example in Italo Calvino's version of Blue Flowers by Raymond Canu, uh, translated into Italian. So here Canu uses uh, colloquial language and harsh obscene words to great effect, especially to characterize Cinderella. Uh, meanwhile, Calvino's translation renders the source text by creatively using compensating Italian equivalents of non-standard and achieves additional lexical consistency of the meanings on originally intended by the author. Evidently, when translated into standard language, the passage wouldn't convey the same effect. And again, you can see the example on the slide. Dialect can also be rendered by choosing an alternative non-standard form in the target language. For example, the translator can modify morphology or syntax, add grammatical mistakes, or invent additional words. Uh, so basically use signs that language is different. In Suzanne Mischke's The Eisheilige, a character of Raukol Rabi speaks in a South Asian dialect. And here uh, in Jean Bowes Bear's translation, um, some particular English dialect is not represented, uh, nor does it echo the German one. It aims instead to reproduce the foregrounding effect. So the translation in this case is the immediate version. It focuses on the general atypical quality of Frau Kohlrabi's manner of speaking and uses modified spelling. So the actual South Asian dialect is not the key point here. It is more important to convey the general unusualness of the character speech because this was the author's intention. The purpose of this kind of speech is to attract attention and highlight Frau Kohlrabi's already eccentric appearance and distract attention from her inner qualities. So in this case, it's more important for the translator to concentrate on the actual purpose than to represent the dialectal speech with precision. So far, main approaches to translation, uh, to translating dialect uh, fall between two extremes, common cases of translating into standard and attempts at creativity. The approaches of translation studies also seem to fall between these two extremes. Some scholars are both skeptical and strict about creative handling of dialect. For example, Clifford Landers puts it in a simple way. The best advice about trying to translate dialect, don't. Alternatively, Federico Federici encourages creative experimentation. Although there is a risk involved, like in all experiments, it also opens up possibilities for infinite creative solutions. Arguably, translating dialects is an exceptional case in literary translation where different rules apply. 
the essential difference of dialect is what's very important to convey. Translating dialect into standard as a common practice is a danger in itself, but leads to extinction of dialect. If we regard dialect as a phenomenon with all that it represents, uh, the social significance and resistance against the dominant language, the very concept that it stands for becomes essential. Showing creativity and attempting to look for equivalence for dialectal writing in target language becomes a support to the very idea of dialect and its nature. It's also a way to record other dialects, providing them with written form that it usually lacks and to emphasize the universal nature of dialects that exist everywhere and share the same issues in comparison to standard language. It's also a way to encourage other authors to write in dialect, igniting creativity and leading to novel, stimulating creative results. Uh, these kinds of results um, are reflected in the case studies of my PhD thesis. For instance, we have an interesting dynamic of dialectal writing and dialectal translations inspiring each other. It starts with Pedro Lenz's novel Der Goli Binich, uh, originally written in Bernese German dialect. It was translated into Scots by Donald McLaughlin, uh, who was in turn inspired by Irvin Welsh's Scots in Trainspotting. Der Goli Binig was also translated into a corresponding Shule Lithuanian dialect by Rimond Eskmita. And this translation was so successful in Lithuania that it resulted in the translator writing an original novel in his own dialect called Pietina Kronika. And you can see all these uh, books um, on the slide, but actually I'm glad to say that there have been new translations of uh, these works as well, and they keep showing up, which shows a really nice um, collaborative element between dialectal translation. Um, just as dialect writing opens the way for other writers to create in their dialects and strengthens the role of dialect itself, creative translations of dialect open up ways, methods, techniques, and inspirations to other translations, creating a certain chain reaction. In this case, the attempt is no less important than the end result. Creative experimentation is the only way to arrive at actual findings in this area. And beyond that, translation of dialects is an effective method to strengthen the overlooked, suppressed status of dialect globally and to change the stereotypical attitudes to it, to see beyond the factor of impoliteness that it is in some cases associated with and change the way it is used and approached. As dialect is a universal thing, um, existing everywhere, dealing with uh, similar issues everywhere, it's essential to show that in translation. It's a practice to be developed and encouraged and above everything else, it requires consideration and attention in every individual instance where dialects and other forms of non-standard are used in literature. And that more or less sums it up. Thank you so much for your attention. I'll just try to go back to my main screen now. It seems that it's has stopped sharing. Uh, thank you so much. It's been really great to share my work with you. And um, I'd be happy to continue this discussion. And I'd like to say that I'm very open for collaborations and discussions about this. So do please feel free to contact me and drop me a question or share your experience. My, Email is on the slides, but just in case, it's key.garanesville at UEAC UK. And thank you again. Thank you, Katrina. That was uh, a, a, a lovely tour d'horizon. Uh, I was uh, I was wondering if you were going to kind of reveal what your PhD is actually on because you gave us some lovely examples and then only in that final disclosure uh, you revealed that your your uh, the main um, uh, the main materials that you're working on in the PhD are, are actually uh, quite different. Um, I, was, I was struck by that Landers quote. Um, it's a great <laughs> line, isn't it? I think, it, I, I presume it's a kind of, it's a reference, there's an old joke in Punch about advice to those about to marry 
don't. I think it's a <laughs> reference to that, but I think it's also it's slightly misleading, isn't it? Because like, what's he saying? He's saying don't translate by sort of substituting a different dialect. Of course, you have to do something with the dialects, and I think presumably Landers would recognize that. Um, it's just that he's actually suggesting that you use a one of your other strategies of the four that you uh, that you isolated there. Yes, it's rather an extreme uh, opinion, I would say. It's just, I guess, Landers acknowledges that there's so much risk involved that it's better not to approach it. But of course, uh, his opinion can be argued, and I think it has. Thank you. Are there any uh, responses, questions uh, in the room or online? I like the way you you brought out uh, uh, the creativity involved in dialect translation, and that reminds me of the um, brings me back to the framework actually, and to the emphasis that we uh, made sure was there in the the framework uh, uh, on uh, the the translators, the literary translators' uh, creativity. I think perhaps we have reached the end of this session and the end of the end of today um and that was a real high point katrina thank you uh for uh introducing us to those uh topics uh to conclude today's um session on in this strand at least um thank you to all our speakers this afternoon i think we don't have uh oana do we uh Etna? no so yeah we so um we will um Oh, hold on. Uh, Ruth uh, has a. Uh, oh, there's an infamous English translation of Thomas Mann's wooden box in which a Munich businessman is rendered as speaking some southern US dialect. Perhaps the translator was thinking southern Germany equals southern US. <laughs> it's yes, a yeah, there actually have been cases like this, and um, many of them are kind of in, in an experimental mode. But I suppose that in theory, it could work, perhaps not in this particular case, it seems a bit too extreme, but actually I'm always interested in seeing it. I mean, I mean, I understand that it can ruin a literary work sometimes or be an unwelcome distraction, but just seeing the attempts of actually achieving that is really interesting to be honest. So thank you for this example. It, it, there's a danger, isn't there? I mean, it, it can work, but it can also not work spectacularly. <laughs> really uh, alienate readers. Um, good. Okay, um, let's then, oh, uh, Belen is, Belen has another example. Ah, thank you, Belen. For Katrina, if she works with Spanish, have a look at Miguel Sainz, uh, sorry, forgive my pronunciation, translation of Berlin Alexanderplatz. Um, there's also a PhD on that. Um, and I won't attempt the remainder of that contribution in Spanish, but perhaps <laughs> in the in the chat. Katrina, I don't know if you wanted to respond to Belen. Yes, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm saving the chat right now, so I'll definitely look this up. And this is what I mean. If anyone comes up with an interesting example of dialect, I'd be more than happy to hear about it. I mean, even if it's later, I'd be very happy if people could email me about this, because right now I'm trying to include as many examples as I can, and they're so just so interesting and so different. Uh, well, uh, a, a final contribution from Ruth in the name, in the interest of hashtag name the translator, that version of Bund Books is by John E. Woods. Um, thank you, Ruth. Thank you to everyone who's been contributing in the chat as well. I think we've uh, demonstrated the, uh, the, the benefits of having a hybrid event and being able to bring people in uh, online and the benefits, uh, the additional benefits of uh, uh, online contributions uh, and the, the, the chat that we've been able to benefit from.